Welcome to today's episode of the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Today, I'm joined by my good friend, Nairi Clark. Nairi shares her wisdom about how we can use ed tech to ramp up culturally responsive practices in our classrooms. Let's get to it. I'm AJ Bianco from Podcast PD, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows in the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast with Jake Miller. Hello, welcome in duct tapers. And of course, welcome to any newbies who have no idea what a duct taper is. (laughs) Well, guess what? You are a duct taper now. Just by pressing play on this podcast, you are officially a duct taper. Actually, there's one last step before you become a full-fledged duct taper. The oath. (laughs) Please repeat after me. I, state name, pledge that I will listen to this slightly silly podcast and attempt to smile and laugh despite how insanely difficult my job is. I also pledge to hear the EdTech ideas and tools mentioned within and to not let myself become overwhelmed by them, but instead to add them to the toolbox of resources that I consider using in my learning environment. I also pledge to send Jake a large bag of Reese cups or peanut butter M&Ms (laughs) It was worth a try, right? (laughs) Anyhow, enough of that. I'm so proud of this episode, not just because it features my friend, Nairi Clark, but also because I think she shares a lot of super valuable information about culturally responsive teaching in this interview. In the past, I thought naively about this as being things that are explicitly about different cultures, races, backgrounds, religions, et cetera, et cetera. And even though teaching about and talking about those things are important, I now see, especially through this talk with Nairi, that there's a foundation that we all need that is not these explicit talks about culture. Instead, there's a set of observable practices that we can focus on that can be and should be part of everything we do. So sometimes integrating the culture and talking about those kinds of things is explicit and is direct, but all of the time, we should be doing things that are culturally responsive. And Nairi does a phenomenal job of breaking that down for us in this episode. You're going to learn so much and your learners are going to benefit from her so much. Earlier in the episode, I started out with a silly oath. Well, I've taken an informal oath to myself to listen to what my mind and body are telling me when I feel stressed or overwhelmed. And when I feel that way, I try to step back and think about whether the things I, quote, need to do, end quote, (laughs) really need to be done, or if I want to them to be done. One thing that I thought I needed was another full episode before taking a winter break. I mean, I thought that if this one comes out the first week of December, I should probably get one in in mid-December too. But I've decided that that's something I want to do, not something I need to do. And I've decided that a better choice is to give myself an extra break so that I can catch up on some other stuff. So this will be my last full episode of 2021. I'll still probably have at least one bonus episode in 2021 and in December. And then I'll come roaring back into your podcast feeds in January, I promise. So if this leaves you an episode short on your commute listening, uh, you get a day where you're like, what do I listen to? Jake didn't put on an episode this week then head over to the Education Podcast Network page and pick out another show to try out. There are so many good ones there. You hear about them at the beginning of every episode of this podcast. If you need an extra show, by all means, go check them out. There's some great ones in there. Speaking of changes based on reflections that I've made, I recently realized that I really miss the hashtag EDU duct tape tweeps segment that I did way back in season one. That's back when I would name everybody who had tweeted about the show since the previous episode. And it was a lot of fun. We, we likened it to a little bit of an ed tech uh, adult romper room where <laughs> we were calling out who the winners were and things like that. And so let's get back to it. That always made me smile. I hope it made you smile. So here are the people who tweeted about the show using the hashtag edu duct tape in the time since my most recent episode with Dr. Will D'Amport. So we got a tweet from Vicky at 33 Hypel 
H-E-U-P-E-L, from Jason Regan in uh, South Korea at discon 4 no D-I-S-K-O-N, the number four, N-O. Uh, Aaron Darnell at Mrs. underscore E. Darnell shared about using Apple Clips, something that she learned about in a past episode featuring Joe and Kristen Merrill. It was a really cool video you showed, Aaron. Uh, Brian Carpenter. Uh, did I say Carpenter? <laughs> Sorry, Brian. Brian Carpenter, <laughs> who is at Brian Carr on Twitter, at B-R-Y-O-N-C-A-R, uh, did a Fresh Air at Five video uh, about the episode with Dr. Will. He almost always does. Brian, thank you for that. He tweets them uh, within the day or two after the podcast episodes come out. There will be one for this episode, I'm sure, where Brian's out on his morning 5 a.m. walk, listens to some podcasts, and then records some uh, reflection on it. And it becomes his podcast, actually. I mentioned earlier earlier find a podcast to listen to you listen to brian's listen to fresh air at five so thank you for that brian next up is janelle jones at janelle j-a-n-e-l joe j-o and the number three three oh one five seven nine seven two nine i don't know how people get that many numbers in their twitter handles janelle i'm curious to hear why you have that many numbers in your twitter handle there uh, but she shared about an episode from way back in the day with dr alec koros it was nice because it pushed me to go back and think about that episode, which was a great one. I haven't thought about that one in a long time. Uh, next up, Stephanie Manley at Mrs. Manley's class, M-A-N-N-L-E is Manley, uh, and at uh, Susan Applin at Applin E-D-U, longtime listener, longtime friend of the show, used to make a spreadsheet of all the episodes and what we talked about in them. I wonder if Susan's still doing that. Uh, past guest Carly Mora at Carly Mora, K-A-R-L-Y-M-O-U-R-A, and finally, John Hartman, which is at Hartel 3rd. H A R T E L three zero. I went back a little bit before the Dr. Will Damport video or episode, I mean, to share a couple other people because I haven't done this in a long time. Uh, if you want to hear your name in the next episode, you know what to do. Before we dive into today's interview, I want to remind you about the Educational Duct Tapers Facebook group. It's a great place to discuss and share with other educators who share a similar approach to technology integration. If you're on Facebook, you could just search for the group titled Educational Duct Tapers, or you can go to facebook.com slash groups slash duct tapers. I think that it's a great place to connect with like-minded educators, to discuss topics from the show, to share ed tech successes, and to ask your ed tech questions. Join us, facebook.com slash groups slash duct tapers. Hi, my name is Lori Guion, and I am Model Schools Coordinator for Abosis in Upstate New York. I love the Educational Duct Tape book because it gives me actionable ways to get my students engaged in whatever it is that I'm doing, whether it's a professional learning session or students in my classroom. I can open up the book and see different ways to get my students uh, to be doing activities, to be engaged in what they're doing. I can see how quickly I can flip learning by using different screencasting tools. It really is one of those books that becomes uh, um, a workbook. It's not just a read from beginning to end, but it's a workbook for you to kind of open up and see what do I, what is what is it that I want to do with my students today or next week or next month? And you'll get some real actionable ways that you can get your students excited about learning. And really, that's what we're here for, right? We want our students to be as excited about learning as we are. So this is definitely something that I would say you want on your desk or on your bookshelf. It's a grab and go book that you're going to come back to over and over again, because there's just so many amazing uh, ways that you can engage students using educational technology. Thank you, Lori, for that endorsement for my new book. The rest of you, I'd love to put your voice in there if you're interested in supporting the book by sharing an audio uh, endorsement for me to pop into the podcast. I would be honored to include that. There are details in the show notes for how you can do that. Also, speaking of the book, I currently have signed copies on the of the book for sale right now. So you can buy a signed copy from me and I will send it your way. Uh, if you order by December 15th, I will ship it in time for it to feasibly arrive by Christmas. So if this happens to be a Christmas gift, if you order by December 15th, it should be there on time. And if you order before that, I would put money on it being there before December 25th. But if it's not a Christmas gift, if it's just for you, I would love to send that signed copy for you. So there's a link in the show notes about how you can buy one. And through December 15th, as kind of kind of part of a Black Friday deal, uh, I'm selling it for less than Amazon by a few dollars. Plus, it comes with the uh, the signature. Can't be that, right? 
Remember how earlier I was talking about being mindful of my stress and times of feeling overwhelmed and giving myself permission to not do things like, for example, another episode in December uh, and how I've been reassessing what I need to do and what I want to do? Well, one thing that I want to do is record a new soapbox uh, episode, record a new soapbox episode, (laughs) record a new soapbox moment for each episode. I want to record one of those every, every episode, but it's not a need to do, especially since I I've got some soapbox moments from the early days of the show that I am really proud of. So every now and then I'll pull out a throwback. Here we're going to go back in time to March of 2019. Talk about the good old days (laughs) for a talk about what I learned from a beard and glasses, which is the soapbox moment from my episode with my friend Amy Rodiger again back in March 2019. Hop into the Edu Duct Tape time machine because here we go. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Let me just grab my soapbox from over here. There we go. That's perfect. Climb up on there. A few weeks ago, I wrapped up a series of soapbox segments about the student pay STEM course that I used to teach, and you thought it was over. But guess what? It's back! (laughs) So you probably thought that at some point everything was perfect in that class. Nope. It's the perfection asymptote. That's a reference for the mathematicians out there. Anyhow, what this means is you can get closer and closer and closer to perfect, but you'll never quite get there. And it's true in the classroom for sure. You can always, always get better and always, always grow. For me, I found my next step in my growth from a beard and a pair of glasses. Like if I've ever heard of a hook, it's guess what I learned from a beard and a pair of glasses. (laughs) In that student pace course, there were a lot of videos, right? That was the way I gave a lot of instructions to kids because the kids got to different activities at different times. So so I couldn't just give them the instructions live and in person each time. It had to be recorded so that whenever they were ready for that activity, my instructions were ready for them. So I recorded a lot of videos for them. Now, for those of you that record videos for your classes, you've probably realized the same thing I do. Your students are not incredibly likely to watch your videos. So I tried a lot of different things to make my kids watch my videos. I would actually often record the videos from my playroom in my house where my kids' toys were. And at varying spots in the video, I would suddenly start playing with my kids' toys or wear a goofy hat from out of my kids' dress-up bin or do part of the screencast in a Chewbacca mask. But still... The kids weren't even watching the videos to get to those goofy things I would do to try to keep them interested. And it's because, you know, they're middle schoolers and and listening to some old dude drone on about STEM for 15 minutes at a time was difficult. But in certain situations, I had to give those instructions. So like one project that we did in the class was building basswood bridges. So the kids had to plan a bridge. It had to meet certain requirements and fit inside of a certain build envelope and have certain aspects to it so they could be tested appropriately. And they had to understand how to use the exacto knives they would use to cut the wood in the project. So I really needed the students to understand some information. So I recorded a video about it. And one particular day, a kid walked up to me in class and said, Mr. Miller, I'm ready to build my bridge. And I said, okay, great. And he said, oh, can I have my wood and my exacto knife? And I said, first, you've got to show me your plan for your bridge so I could tell you if the bridge plan meets the requirements for the design. And then, yes, then you can have the exacto knife and the wood. And he said, what plan? I don't have a plan. Uh, Why is this my kid voice? (laughs) Why does my 13-year-old kid voice sound like an old man who who runs a summer camp somewhere in the woods. <laughs> Anyhow, so I said, I said, did you did you watch the video? And he said, yeah, I watched the video. Of course I watched the video. And I said, well, then where's your plan? And he said, I, I don't, what plan? And I said, the plan that I talked about in the video. And he like gave me this weird look. And I said, you didn't watch my video where I gave the instructions. And he said, yeah, I did. And I said, no. No, I'm I'm pretty sure you didn't, because if you had watched the video, you'd have a plan to show me that shows that you understand the type of bridge that we're building here and the choices that you have and what you're building. And he said, oh, yeah, I watched it. And and I said, but you, but you don't have a plan. And he said, oh, yeah, right. I, I thought I'd get the materials first. And I said, but I told you in the video, you have to do the plan first, and then you get the materials. And I asked him a question. So first, I'll give you a little backstory here. 
At this time, when this young man was in my class, it was the spring of that school year. And it used to be that I would have a beard during the winter and I would shave it off in the spring. And of course, first I would shave most of the beard off and take pictures of myself with fun mustaches. And then I'd shave it all the way off. <laughs> Nowadays, I'm just beard all year round. But at this particular point when the student had me in class, it was the spring, so I had no beard, right? And it was also the year where I had LASIK eye surgery, so I had no glasses, no contacts as well. But at the time that I recorded the video, you see, it was the winter, and I had a beard. Not only that, but it was a couple of weeks before my LASIK eye surgery, so I had to wear my glasses all the time leading up to that surgery. I couldn't wear my contacts. So in the video that this student claimed he had watched, I had a beard and glasses. But here I stood in front of the student, no beard, no glasses. So I said to him, all right, what did I look like in the video? And his friend was in the background. This is so classic. I'd still picture it. His friend's in, his background, in the background waving his hand saying, beard, glasses, beard glasses but he doesn't hear him and he his answer well first he gives me this look like what <laughs> but his answer is the best answer i could ever imagine him saying this is this is i am not changing the story for your benefit this is exactly what he said to me he said you looked handsome <laughs> So classic. I can't believe he said handsome. And I was like, well, th thank you. But um, no, like, like, did I look different from how I look now? And he said, no, you, you look the same way you look now, exactly the same. And I said, I, there was nothing different about me. He says, well, nothing. You were wearing different clothes, but there was nothing different about you. And I said, nothing different about my face in the video. He says, no, you, you look like you. And I said, there was nothing at all different in this area. And I gestured towards my beard and he said, no, looked like you. And I, and I said, well, or here. And I gestured towards my eyes. And he said, no, you look like you. And I said, was I wearing glasses in the video? And he said, no, you weren't wearing glasses. You don't wear glasses, Mr. Miller. And I said, yeah, well, in that video, I did wear glasses. He was like, no, oh, why would you wear glasses in the video? And I said, did I have a beard in the video? And he said, Mr. Miller, you don't have a beard. <laughs> In the video, I had a beard, and then I showed him the video, and sure enough, I had a beard and glasses. So I realized that for whatever reason, middle school students didn't watch my videos, but what it all came down to was this E plus R equals O that I've talked about before. The O that I needed, the outcome that I needed was for my students to understand my expectations for their bridge building project, to understand how to plan their bridge, to come to me and show me a plan, and then to understand how to appropriately use an X-Acto knife, what the safety protocols were, and start using it. I needed them to gain that all from the video. So that was the O I wanted. The E was that middle school students were unlikely to watch videos recorded by their teachers. I, I, I can't control that. That's the E. So I had to determine an R that would take that E and get me to that O. So I, I decided I had two different choices, right? One was to make super well-produced, hysterical, really engaging, suspenseful videos that my kids were going to be compelled to watch, like something that would be on Netflix. And that's not realistic. So the second choice was to find a way to, you, you hate to do this because you really want to empower your students to want to do things and to be intrinsically motivated to do things. But in this situation, I just had to force them to watch the videos because in this situation, that, that was my only choice. So what I used in that point in time was called Zaption. Zaption is gone nowadays. For those of you listeners who know Zaption, you know how heartbroken I was when Zaption went away. The closest to equivalent to Zaption nowadays is Edpuzzle. So what I would do in Zaption today in Edpuzzle is take the video that I had recorded and at certain points in the video build in questions. Now, in a content area classroom, those questions would be formative assessment in nature. They would be based on what they had previously seen in the video to determine if they comprehended it before they moved on to the next point. So the teacher could then go back and look at that data. In my sp specific instance here, I just wanted to make sure this kid knew how to use an X-Acto knife. I wanted to make sure that he knew that he was supposed to have a plan. I wanted to make sure that he knew that he was supposed to figure out the, the side lengths of all the portions of the bridge before he started cutting them. I wanted to make sure he understood the directions. I wanted to make sure that I knew that he had watched the video. But in most classrooms, it's for actually making sure they understand content. But 
Zaption back in the day, Edpuzzle today are the perfect tool for doing that. What they do is you build in questions at certain points in the video, you send it out to students, they watch them, and then as the teacher, you get back data to see if they watched it, how many times they watched each segment of it, as well as if they got questions right or wrong so that you could provide follow-up instruction to the students who needed it. We actually mentioned this a couple episodes back about how you could build this into your classroom to do some formative assessment as you go. I believe it was in episode five with Alex Oris. I'm not really sure. That, my friends, is educational duct tape, right? I went from recording these videos that gave kids instructions, discovering that they weren't watching the videos, and saying, but I need them to watch the videos, and then going, you know what? What I'll have to do is make them watch the videos, and Edpuzzle did that for me. I wish that they were just empowered and driven and motivated to do it themselves, but in this situation, I needed to find a way to do it, and fortunately for me, educational duct tape to the rescue, Zaption helped me, and nowadays in your classrooms, Edpuzzle can help you. And actually, there's an alternative to Edpuzzle out there called PlayPosit, and PlayPosit can totally help you in this situation as well. Same general principle. You take a video that's on YouTube or another platform, you embed questions, instructions, reminders, notes, and especially prompts to make sure the students understand the content into the video. And then as a teacher, you get back that data. And as a student, they get a little bit of self-assessment as they're going through it. And that, my friends, is educational duct tape at its finest. And this is the end of my story of the student-paced STEM course. Or is it? (laughs) Let's get to our guest. Today's guest. All right, today's guest is Nairi Clark, my buddy Nairi Clark. She is an EdTech Curriculum Program Specialist for the Colton Joint Unified School District. She is a founding co-member of the hashtag Equity in Action CA chat and was appointed to the Instructional Coaches Advisory Board for Future Ready Schools organization. She is very passionate about amplifying the voices of the unheard through culturally responsive teaching pedagogy. You could find Nairi on Twitter at Ms. Nairi Clark or on Instagram at nyri underscore edu or check out her website at nyreclark.com. But here, not on nyreclark.com, here in the Educational Duct Tape Podcast is the actual Nyri Clark. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, Jake. It's so good to hear from you. Yes. <laughs> Nyri and I, over the last few years, have been chatting on Twitter and Voxer and all of the places. So it's nice to finally channel that that discussion into uh, into the actual podcast. Do you agree? I agree. It's like the man, the myth, the legend. I'm on. (laughs) (laughs) The man, the myth. You're supposed to say like the friend, the guy I talk to on Boxer, the guy I tweet with. (laughs) The the guy who eats lunch at ISTE with me. Oh, yes. Yes. I love it. (laughs) Yes. Session hopping. That's right. (laughs) Yes. And I, so we were, let's see, I was at, I was at a John Carippo and Marlena Hebern session with, um, uh, Sunny Magania and I ran into Les uh, Dinerstein. I, I don't know if it's Dinerstein or Dinerstein. I think it's Dinerstein. And I ran into Les there at that session, and Les was like, "Where are you going to next?" And I was like, "Well, I'm going to go grab some lunch over at what was that that place, the market across from, and down in Philadelphia." What, remember I don't that even market? Remember called? the name of the market? But everyone, it is a gigantic food place. Yes. Like you just go in there, and there's hundreds of different shops to eat at. So yeah. that was the place. Yeah, <laughs> that for was sure. The place and- to be. Yeah, so Les and I walked over there and got in line at like a barbecue place, I think. And then you and Michael Wesley walked up, right? I don't think we even planned to meet up with you guys. You guys just appeared there. That's how it is. That is the best part of EdTech conferences, bumping into your... Uh, bumping into your squad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You and and Michael wearing your matching coordinated outfits that he had probably planned for you. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's him. He is by far, by far the fashionista of the two of us. <laughs> you guys were probably wearing matching purple t-shirts with unicorns on them or something. And unicorns kitties. dabbing and kitties. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I was he like, I want to have lunch swag. with these people. Yes, all the swag, that's for sure. 
<laughs> lunch was great. I love it. That That is um, the highlight of the conferences and just being in ed tech is being able to, I think it's the first time I met you in person. So being yeah, yeah. able to see your people in person and um, having that time to talk. And I mean, like we were still grabbing and you were like, ah, ah, I got to go to the next session and you right. were out of there. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember if I was presenting or what was going on, but yeah, I took off running for, for something after that. And I, I think like that was my first like bigger conference. Like I had done the ones around here around Ohio. And so like, I could go to a conference and I'd see, you know, Eric Kurtz and, and Ann Radefeld and Amy Rodiger and these other friends of mine who are from Ohio that I know. And then they present around Ohio and we don't normally get to see each other except for these conferences. So I have that, that like a, like a junior size scale of that experience, but then going to ISTE and there's, you know, Nairi from California and Michael from, I think, New Jersey and Les from uh, another area of California and like all of these people that you're running into. Oh, just so cool. I, I want I want that experience back someday soon. I'm telling you, that is the that's the best part about some of these conferences going back face to face is yeah. um, there's just nothing like that, that face to face connection and being mm -hmm. able to see your people, see their face, their body language, and then having those times to peel out and just sit in the hallway and dissect and digest what you're learning. Oh, yeah, that's the best. That's yeah. the best. It was great meeting you in person too yeah, and you eat well people jake eats food like real food like not nibbles <laughs> we grubbed so it was great <laughs> now i'm imagining i must have been like really scarfing down my meal the way the way like my 12 year old does when we put food in front of him <laughs> we're so impressed so impressed <laughs> You, Jake's a really good eater. Great way to go, Jake. Way to go. <laughs> well, eat all your stuff. <laughs> you you know you know that my love language is is actual a verbal affirmation. So thank you for affirming my <laughs> my lunch eating. <laughs> I'm sitting there with the sandwich like I need more barbecue sauce. Somebody give me more barbecue sauce. And Nairi's like, you've got it all over your face already, Jake. You I love it. I love it. There's you've evidence. Got, <laughs> you've got barbecue sauce in your beard, man. You don't need any more. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Jake, Jake eats well, she says. <laughs> Hashtag that. <laughs> Hashtag Jake eats well. I do. I do. I actually, it's, it's accurate. <laughs> My son is peeking around the corner at me right now. I'm like, normally they're so able to keep quiet while I'm doing these interviews, but he's probably like, what is dad talking about? Because <laughs> he can't hear you. He just hears me laughing and talking about of Jake. Of course. Too. Like it's a one-sided, really weird conversation. And they're, and they're trying to fill in the gaps. Like what, what is could the other possibly? person saying? <laughs> I thought daddy talked about technology for teachers. Right? <laughs> Mom, Dude. he's talking to someone else. <laughs> Mom, I heard him say love language and it's called. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, gosh. We're off the rails already. Uh, I, you know, because it's been a while, friend. <laughs> yes, it has. As I I'm agree. picturing this, even in your book, you said like, I'm, I'm drinking a beer off camera. I'm like, I'm envisioning that right now. <laughs> even in our meetups, it's like, here's my beer. It's off camera. Can you see that? Okay. No. Is, is it in the video? Is it in our troubleshooting video? Okay, we're good. <laughs> that, was, that was definitely in some of those videos. Right now, though, it's 1046 in the morning here. Oh, where, okay. where we're calling. So I've got my, my water bottle to my right and my coffee to my left. I know it's even oh. earlier for you so if you have a beer with you I right <laughs> it's how we do it in california we my, start straight this is my morning beer <laughs> Uh, Nairi, the next thing we're supposed to do right now is play a game, but I feel <laughs> I'm feeling like we barely even need one right now. We're, we're goofing and talking about my eating habits and whether or not I record the podcast with a beer or not. Oh no, uh, man, you got to go for this two truths yes. and a lie because I usually suck at this. So okay. I think I got a good one this time. Okay, I'm ready. All right, well let's <laughs> let's do it. So you're going to give me three statements, and I'm going to try to guess what the lie is. Here, let's see how you do. Two truths and one lie. All right, here we go. Uh, number one, me and my hubby were comic relief on a sitcom taping. Number two, I climbed a waterfall in Hawaii. Number three, I tried out and made the dance team for UNLV's uh, cheerleading squad while in college. Wow, those are three statements. The fact that two of those are true, that's pretty impressive. So you were comic relief on like a, like a sitcom set. Is that what you mean, like at a filming? 
That's correct. Fail me. Okay. And you climbed a waterfall in Hawaii, and you tried out for and made the UNLV cheerleading squad. I am guessing the... Hmm... I'm guessing the sitcom part is the lie. No, no, I think that's true. I'm guessing the cheerleaders lie. Not that I'm I'm doubting your ability to do, I don't know, whatever the cheerleading moves are. I wish I could reference a certain move. Um, I'm, I'm not doubting your ability. I love how you're cleaning this up right now. Keep on going. Right. <laughs> see, if you, see if you can do, see if you pull this off, Jake. Make it sound cool. <laughs> I think you were, I obviously I've got to go with a comic relief, like listen to you right now. And then, um, I, I believe you're an, you're an outdoorsy kind of gal. And I think you, I think you did climb a, climb a waterfall in, um, in Hawaii. So I think, I think the lie is the cheerleader one. Oh, this is so awesome. I did this great. The lie is actually I climbed a waterfall in Hawaii. Oh no! Yes. Okay, and and it's it was so hard for me to do this because I actually did climb a waterfall, but it was in Jamaica. Oh gosh, that's so cheap! You can't do that. <laughs> that's against that's against the moral code of this it's, game. It's, <laughs> it's like I'm struggling. <laughs> oh, I will tell you that back in the uh, what was it? Yeah, back in the '90s, though, uh, making this cheerleading squad for UNLV because they are on uh, TV. They were their basketball team was um, enormous, and they were on TV. You had to be a certain weight. Oh yes, you did. And um, what, I was. What is, what's, what is I that? What is know, that? I know. And the comic relief was so funny uh, during those tapings. If um, if people, um, you know, while they're changing the sets and everything, mm -hmm. I actually was able to call my husband and we had to play a game where they asked me questions. They called him and asked him questions and they asked your favorite, what was my favorite food? And he said Oreos and the audience just went crazy. I'm like, that's not even food. That's dessert. He was like, that's what you like to eat. So yeah, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Ouch, ouch. <laughs> and you were like, I do really like Oreos. I was like, fettuccine. I like fettuccine. You don't talk up about when I eat that whole row of Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my god! The gosh. whole row of Oreos. It was great. Well, I tell you, two truths and a lie. I tried my best. That's about as good as that I can good. get. <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. Okay. So you did climb a waterfall. It was in Jamaica, which yes. sounds sounds majestic and amazing. <laughs> Um, and you were on the cheerleading squad. I'm sorry. I doubted well, your, I your cheer it. abilities. It's okay. I made it. And I decided that I was not going to lose 20 pounds when I looked fine. So yeah. I, I passed, but I yeah. did make the squad. You so tried yeah. out. You did make I it. Did. Okay. I did. That's, that is insane. What is, what is, why is that even a thing? What is it? What's, I what's, know. I, yeah, whatever. Okay. And then what was the, what was the sitcom? I didn't hear what it was. I heard the I story. I do not remember it. Like it, it was that long ago. I don't oh, so remember. It was, a, it was a big hit then, huh? Oh, right. Exactly. <laughs> One of those that was like only a season. So, um, yeah, but it was, it was awesome to, to be able to watch that. I mean, we're at Southern California. Of course we go yeah. to the, see sitcoms being taped. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> it was we've a got... field trip, a high school field trip. So it was awesome. Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> uh, um, so we have, um, with lots of people have been been parts of shows on, in educational duct tape podcast history. We had oh. um, uh, Natasha Rachel said that she was in an episode of Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Oh that was gosh, one of her two awesome. in one line. I thought that show was my jam. I used to love the yes. whole TJF show lineup. And yes. then um, Joe Marquez was on an episode of Judge Judy, which we still have not found the tape of. Oh my gosh, we gotta hunt that down. Uh, I have to are, see him there. People are looking for it. I, <laughs> he was very comfortable telling us the story, but I think if somebody's able to find the find the the tape, he might he might offer up some money to keep it. Hit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so on the hunt. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. So look at the, you guys are are three superstars right there. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to jump into our educational duct tape question for today. So for those people out there that might be new listeners, an educational duct tape question is a question that a teacher might ask or an educator might ask. And we try to then answer that question using a tool, educational duct tape. So just like duct tape isn't something we set forth to use, 
when we have a certain problem or something needs fixed, duct tape is a great tool that we might use in that situation. So when we think about an educational duct tape question, it's the teacher saying, how can I do this? Or how can I improve this about my practice? And then we try to find that educational duct tape, that educational technology that helps them with it. So based on your um, expertise dealing with, as we said in your bio, as part of the hashtag equity in action CA as a, as a co founding co-member of that and uh, as part of the Coaches Advisory Board for the Future Ready Schools uh, organization, I know you have a lot of expertise and do a lot of work uh, relating to the ideas of of equity and of all of these different practices that we need to bring into our teaching. And this is this is an, a learning area for me, Nyria. That's something you and I have talked about over the years too. Mm -hmm. And so the question I have for you is: What are some observable practices I would see? a culturally responsive practitioner do in their classroom. So what are those things that if I walk into somebody's classroom and they are a culturally responsive practitioner, what are some some things that they'd be doing that I would notice right away and go, oh, th there it is. There's that, there's that observable practice right there. Oh, that's a great question, Jake. Great question. Well, you know what? I'm going to start with um, saying that uh, culturally responsive teaching, like uh, for most people, as you are uh, reading the books and getting all this knowledge that you're probably wondering, like, what does that mean? Am I just teaching um, kids about their culture? What is that? And it's actually the act of taking students, um, like, like bringing all of that child and the educator into that classroom, into that learning environment. So what link, what is your language? What is your life experience? What is everything about you? that I can connect to content to um, to amplify learning. And I'm going to share with um, with the audience a Ready for Rigor framework, which was created by Zaretta Hammond. So many people have uh, probably read the book, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, which is outstanding because it allows you to see what, um, and for this, well, I won't even call it CRT, but uh, culturally responsive teaching will allow you to really amplify student learning through these processes. So there's four core areas. There's awareness, learning partnerships, information processing, and community of learners and learning environment. So if I'm starting with like teacher awareness, this is a great opportunity where teachers are able to, to see their own cultural lens and what are they bringing into that space. And I personally, I like to use, um, we love Paula from Slides Mania. I love to use Paula's um, digital workbooks that mm. I can just kind of use those, download it and organize it for myself with my students, for my reflections, for my um, information that I need to, to find out about students, uh, kind of those running notes about things that I might find out or even things that I want to work on for myself as I am kind of adjusting my socio-political context um, around race and language. Like we're always learning um, and things are always shifting. And hopefully every class is a different group of kids, you know, mm -hmm. different experience. So um, that's what I do there for um, awareness. But there's also learning partnerships. Well, like let me ask you a question about awareness sure. before we jump away from that. So I, sure. I personally, the way I kind of structure my my reflection is I have a, a spreadsheet and each tab in the spreadsheet is a month and it looks like a calendar in there. I got a template from some website. I could put a link in the show notes. I forget what it was. But anyway, I got this template and I have a spreadsheet and it's a calendar and I have each date has kind of my lesson plan in it, like a bulleted list of what we're going to do. And then I have a cell underneath that where I then after the day is over, maybe the next morning, I'll put in my reflection so that next year when I go look at that, uh, I'll know, oh, this took too long or this was, you know, I should add this in or this was missing or this was good and this wasn't good. And so I'll reflect on whatever I notice in there, but I, I, I've never thought about doing kind of a, a, like a reflection on my cultural lens while I'm doing that. Do you think that, so when you use this slides mania template that you're talking about, do you, would you put in um, direct questions about that or would, how would you make sure that those are the kind of reflections people take out of it? Is, is that the best way to do it, is just put in a certain question to ask yourself? Oh, it could. Oh, and I love your template too. So please share that in the in the yeah. notes. Um, but yeah, it could be a question. Maybe it could even be like a trigger. What is something that triggered you? Because sometimes there's things that happen that you might be um, unaware of. You know, I used to be triggered by um, hats and hoodies uh, mm -hmm. because I was raised where that was a sign of disrespect. But that's not for everybody, you know. So that was something that I had to adjust 
was that hat, was that student wearing that hat or hoodie interfering with their ability to learn content? Heck no, you know, so I had to adjust. So those, um, some of those things, like what's the, what is your trigger? Um, some, um, also what are words that you're learning? Like kids, they have a new language for everything. So maybe some of that is writing in those, those responses yeah. too. you know, like I learned, I learned cap, you know, my, you, my son, I mean, that's old, but you know what I'm saying? Like if, if you are that teacher where you're not hearing some of uh, some of that language, some of that slang, and and you're trying to just be aware, you know, not right. that you have to use it, but right. just be aware so you know what their conversation means. <laughs> that's those things that you can put in there, like just your idea. awareness, you know. And yeah. I would also even add, Jake, like even um, it it could be links to to other things, like mm. links to something you want to look back up on, links to um, like um, I'm always taking anti bias quizzes, implicit bias quizzes, just to kind of check myself and see yeah. where I'm leaning more bias towards um, mm-hmm. different things, just, you know, to be aware and then to see what adjustments I need to make along the way, whether I'm working with kids or adults. I love that. That's great. Mm-hmm. Okay. Le- okay. So second is learning partnerships. So tell us about that. Yes. Oh my goodness. Learning partnerships. So here, here is something that many times teachers will think, oh, learning partnerships. I got this. All I need to do is get to know my kids. So we're talking about going deeper than what's your favorite color? What do you like to watch? We're talking about actually creating that partnership with your students where you know their goals, their academic goals, as, where, as well as their personal goals and help helping um, to scaffold them along the way so that they can move that. This is where teachers are, are actually balancing that shift between um, being um, supportive, knowing um, all the social emotional parts of your students, but also giving them that academic challenge, that academic push. So um, many people have heard me use this analogy of like going to the gym. Um, when I used to go to the gym and I would be in the class doing <laughs> doing the stuff with the people, the trainer, and they would just, you know, you're doing the clean and press and oh this is as far as I can go and they're like go a little bit more and you push just that little bit that's where we want our kids like they don't mm-hmm. think they can do it but then we we um, support them to push just that much farther and while you're in this um, learning partnerships this is where teachers are actually able to to create those flip grids and have those moderated boards where you can have that conversation with them you could um use green screens and uh, not green screens, but actually screen castifies mm. to um, allow them to share, share their learning, share their thoughts and add some of those um, visuals or images into what they're doing. Have that dialogue uh, with students where you could, um, it could be even just private questions in your LMS. Like if you're using Seesaw, if you're, cause it could be for littles too. So everyone out there, you know, you can start this with preschool all the way up to your, your higher ed students. I use, I use this with higher ed too, but just being able to balance care and push and, and it's ongoing. So it's nothing that you do just at parent conference time, you know, just at the end of the term, this is, this is ongoing. This is the whole time to let them know that you're, there with them to partner with them in this learning experience for this year to to push them through. Yeah, I like so the, I, I like I your point. That. Yeah, I like your point there that um, by doing things like those flip grids or those screencasts or things like that, that gives your students a chance to express themselves in a way that's them, right? Not just right. giving you the answer you expect on an extended response, um, fitting in kind of that that typical bubble. You know, there are places where we need kids to be able to maybe write you know, their three sentence extended response and, and assess them that way, because that prepares them maybe for some standardized test that we wish we weren't giving them. But <laughs> and when, when, when we when we're not doing those things, it, why not bring in some of these other ways to express themselves? And maybe it doesn't even relate to content, right? But by letting them do it, uh, especially with video or audio or things like that, that lets us hear or see kind of a, a, a peek almost into their their real selves, right? Absolutely. And that's the culturally responsive part of it is that it's going to look different. Mm. Uh, students will be able to, and whenever I think of these things, I think of my my fake students, which I'm going to pull out my my PLN, you know? So if I have my dear sweet D Lanier or Ken Shelton, you know, maybe it's it's in images or Monica, um, it's it's in images that they want to speak or it's D likes music. So is it is it a song he's writing? Is it a rap he's writing? Is it, um, is it, 
uh, a spoken word that he's mm-hmm. going to give me some context back. Is it a student that loves to write poems or or wants to code something, you know, like <clears throat> Being able to allow them to communicate in the way that's best for them, um, and then you are supporting that, that is the part that makes it culturally responsive, like mm-hmm. allowing your ELL students to speak in their native tongue um, on, on some things, you know, like, of course, we it, it's they're still learning your standards, but allowing them to bring that in wherever they can and tie that into content, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I love I love that. I love that. And, and I think the important part like I, so I'm looking at a um kind of the, the framework a, 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 a single sheet infographic of the the framework from Ready mm-hmm. for Rigor and in, in that leading partnerships section it says a balance balance giving students both care and push. So That's right. you're showing that you're you're pushing them to express to to master the content, to, to learn, to grow. And you said that earlier with the awareness of, of stepping like, like in the gym, you know, when you're lifting just a little bit more than you thought you could, but by doing it in these ways and by responding to them in these ways, you're also showing that care too, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you, we've heard the quote over and over, you know, kids don't know, you know, you care about them until you show it yeah. and they're not going to be invested unless they know that you're in, you, you got their back, you know, right. like, and how do we show that? And how do we be authentic? They, even a kindergarten can smell when you are not true with them, you know, yeah. they know it. So being able to be authentically you as, as much as we can professionally be as right. well with our students um, goes a long way because they need to see our flaws. They need to see when we have done something um, that may be offensive, but we don't know, you know, and then we make those corrections and we yeah. apologize like we're we're human just like they are and they need to see that as well yeah, i've had those conversations even in fourth grade with some students where i've i've had a misstep and and there was so much respect um from the students when i apologized to them about something that um that was off for them, you know, and, and we had that conversation and we grew as a a community and those kids are, uh, many of those kids are still in my life right now. And I think it's because of that, they got to see me as a person. Um, and you know, and, and we grew, we grew past that. I love that. That's great. So then we have, um, this was one of my, uh, one of my favorite parts. And, and this is where teachers live is this information processing. So this is where students are actually able to show what they know. And I tell you what, Jake, when I was, um, cause I am one of the people that actually bought educational duct tape. Yay. So <laughs> I did, I did. And, um, what I love about your book as a ed tech coach, um, I can actually share bits and pieces of this with uh, teachers that I support. Um, And you don't have to read it all at one time. Like you can jump in and out and kind of go for what is going to um, support you. And in information processing, this is where kids get to show what they know. So when I'm looking, um, I pulled out some parts on chapters, ooh, Uh, chapters three and four for formative assessment for sure, because uh, this is where teachers are constantly um, looking for that feedback, making sure that the lesson is okay. Um, Kids are able to to take what their prior knowledge is and connect it to new learning. And how teachers can do that culturally responsibly is letting them bring in who they are. You know, like, what is your life experience? Oh, I know that you like to do this. I had a student whose parents worked at a swap meet. So this kid was good in math. He knew how to break Uh, things apart. I'm telling you, he knew how to set things up. He knew um, the probability and all of that. So allowing him to bring in that known experience into those, into those lessons made it so much more meaningful, made the learning sticky for him, you know, and we're also looking at, Oh my gosh, chapter eight creation tools. If you guys don't have this book chapter eight, there was, there was even some check marks. Like um, there's some things I haven't used here, but this is where Flipgrid screencastify. This is where green screen uh, works. We videos uh, for students sound trap. If they like um, music, like I think of D if he was in school, he would have loved um, having a sound trap to be able to, to show what you're knowing. Like people, yeah. students can, I saw, um, oh my goodness, my friend, my friend, Frankie, Frankie uses podcasting um, with her students, but it starts in writing. So yeah. how are we, you know, how are we connecting that? 
And those cognitive routines, you think of cognitive routines, we think of Edge Protocols and John Carupo, like what are things that students are able to repeat? Zaretta Hammond calls it habits of the mind. Like how are we creating those habits of the mind? For our students, being able to um, re- revisit that information allows them to, to strengthen those synapses and then they're able to um, make learning sticky there too. So um, your formative assessments live here. And then those creation tools, how do we know what they what they can do unless we give them that opportunity to do it, you know, and then allowing student choice. And that's why we want that student choice is because everyone processes a little differently. And if we can amplify the way that they process, then it makes it more engaging for them. There's more buy-in. I know they can't do what they want all the time, but they can do it most of the time or some of the time at least, you know, so as um, educators being able to take take some of the work off there. I mean, we work so hard sometimes doing everything like imagine um, what that, that uh, role of the facilitator looks like everyone, like um, we need to step into that role a little bit more. And um, I think that comes with, you know, it comes with time. It comes with pedagogy and with practice. uh, But um, information processing, that's, that part is, is the magic sauce for us teachers with students, because that's where we get to see what they know. And that's where we can make our adjustments for instruction as well. Right. I, I think so. I think the big takeaway from information processing is that you have to, you have to be gathering some kind of assessment data to make decisions based off of and utilizing it. But I think your point about the giving them some choice, giving them some authentic opportunities is huge. And there's a quote that I, I found during the research phases of, of writing the book from Rick Wormelli. And I love Rick's work, but he, he had the specific quote that I put in there that I think is just perfect for this. He said, and I had to grab my copy of, of the book to, to, to quote it out of. He, I'm quoting, this is Jake Miller quoting Jake Miller quoting Rick Wormelli right now. He said, some educators treat assessment as an affliction rather than as a tool. And I think that's like like, that boils it down so well that it's it's not just an affliction for the student, but an affliction for us. Right. If we're doing it the same way for everyone, number one, we're not serving the needs of our students well and we're not being culturally responsive, but also we're creating a a, a situation that is boring for us as graders, right? I was grading some extended response questions the other day and it was torture. And I was like, why? Why did I have everybody type this? Why did I give everybody the same exact question and have them type it? I am torturing myself. Why didn't I give, you know, make this more authentic and give them some choice? Like I felt like I had punished myself for it. It was it was easier, but it it actually I think took me longer because I kept like as I was grading, like my mind was wandering and I was oh, having yes. a hard time focusing cuz like I I had read 70 versions of this same exact thing some of them written better than others and it was torture but if i had let them make some videos and some animations and record a narration or record a song about it or whatever as long as they master the show mastery of the standards in there it would have been so much more interesting for me more fun for me i would have more pride about it and the students would have felt more connected to the process too and more seen by the process too which would have been so much better in so many ways Oh my gosh, that that's like the the mic drop moment right there, Jake. Absolutely, and I think all teachers have had um, a aspect or of that right there. Like, how why am I getting the same exact um, copy of this thirty mm-hmm. times? You know, like those presentations I used to do where every kid said the same thing. The kids were tortured, I was tortured, we were right. all over it. But you know, there you go. But as soon as I allowed them that voice, yeah. And it became different. Everybody was looking forward to the next thing because you didn't know what was coming. Right. So um, so as a teacher, planning that out and as a coach, even with, um, you know, we go to all these conferences. We It's the same thing. We're still trying to engage our audience and and bring something into it where they can they can. Um, have a little piece of themselves in there. Um, it's in crafting those responses. So I think that is something that I'm still uh, working on as well, trying to figure out how can I get a different response from everyone? Mm. And and I put that into, into practice when I'm working with students. I mean, sometimes an assessment is an assessment, but like you said, if it's if it's real where you're trying to, to do that formative assessment where you need to make a shift in instruction, then you want to, to be able to craft that. And critical thinking skills, Skills. Ooh, let's just do this real quick too. Um, <laughs> critical thinking skills, culturally responsive. How are we allowing all students access to high level critical thinking skills? And information processing is where that lives as well. 
Um, you have some some teachers, maybe you have heard, Jake, like, not those kids, or mm-hmm. they can't do that, or they are just repeatedly ask, um, asking students DOK one and two questions, where maybe just the high performing kids or the gay kids are getting three and four. So mm-hmm. how are we shifting to make sure that all students have access to those high level critical thinking skills? And, um, and we and as teachers, we facilitate and scaffold them up there. You know, so everybody gets the high level and then we support the ones that can't make it there themselves like yeah. that. That's part of um, culturally responsive teaching as well. And that's for everyone. So culture has nothing to do with with the race. It's mm-hmm. it's our life experiences. Right. You know, race is a part of it, but it, it's overall like Jake gets high level critical thinking skills, just like Nairi does. Right. And how and how can we get there? And um, do you all use um, death and complexity prompts for gate students? Have you heard of these um, icons, icons that match critical thinking skills was a big shift in in our area uh, um, down here, teaching uh, teachers how to access those critical thinking skills and embed them into their into their uh, standards and objectives. That was a huge shift. And that was one way that we were starting to see the shift, especially with our ELL students, um, low socioeconomic um, students, um, having access to that was one of the ways that we were able to really shift those those students out of um, dependent learners into independent learners. And that's what um, that's what the culturally responsive uh, framework is for as well, is how can we shift those learners that are dependent and make them independent learners? And through all of these four areas, we'll get to the last one in just a second. That that's where we're moving towards. Wow. Yeah. So I, I'm here Googling while you're talking. My, my, oh. my, I was not being polite right there. So, so I was looking up. So for, first of all, for people who aren't familiar with it, it's interesting how we have different um, acronyms in different places. So GATE yes. is Gifted and Talented Education. Oh, and this, this understanding depth and complexity. Um, I, yeah, I, I was not familiar with that before you said it there. So, so can you tell us a little bit more about depth and complexity and how that relates? Absolutely. So it was uh, created by Dr. Sandra Kaplan um, at USC and uh, Betty. Um, oh, gosh, I don't remember her last name. I'm sorry, Betty. Um, uh, they actually Betty Gold. Pre- thank you, Betty Gold. That's my they Google actually- right there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> One of us is on it. <laughs> <laughs> they actually created these icons to go along with the critical thinking skills back when we were doing state testing um, in California. So you'll see like details. They took out the key words and phrases, uh, critical thinking skills from those assessments when we were state testing. So details, what's the perspective? Um, what is the ethics? What's the trends? What are the patterns? And they mm-hmm. attached a icon um, with it. So as a teacher, if I were were to teach a, a lesson that has multiple perspectives and I wanted more um, I wanted more viewpoints on it I could just show the symbol of eyeglasses and the students would over time would learn that that icon would get their brain ready to start thinking about multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. So it was so instrumental while I was teaching my ELL students that if I had a student that just came um, into my classroom, um, had low English skills, the icons helped that student to really understand where the thinking skill was and was able to flourish. So I used it as a scaffold to get to those deeper critical thinking skills and then even combining them, you know, what is the pattern um, over time of all the three little pigs in in um, in the book? You know the story of the three little pigs, and and um, what is it ethical that um, that the wolf was you know blowing all their houses down or or what mm-hmm. have you? But like adding those um, thinking prompts into your objectives just adds depth and complexity, and it adds it for all of the students. So if you have a student that's not quite sure of what that word ethical means or what perspective is, that's where you can add in that language of the discipline or you mm-hmm. add in the vocabulary for all the students, not just yeah. for, for the gate students, but all the students, um, the gifted students, um, they're, they're having access to that. So that was one of the ways that we were able to really start to make our objectives and standards a little more complex and a little deeper. And I've actually started using even those prompts in presentations as I'm presenting out with with, um, you know, uh, our ed tech conferences around, I'm, I'm adding that into it so that my, my, um, 
my prompts and and the things that we're working on isn't too stale or or boring or or low level you know right. like how can we how can we make it meaty how can we really add some of that critical thinking skills so i'm still i'm still honing my craft but that's that's one of those um that's another scaffold to make sure that everyone has access to that um, to those high level critical thinking skills. Oh, I love that. That's, that's so cool. And I like how to just having those pictures once the students were to get used to them, yes. um, that it's that visual cue there. Cause I, I think we've all yes. had that time where we were grading something. We're looking at student responses to a question and we're like, oh, their mind wasn't even in the right place. Like this wasn't what I was asking, right? They weren't right. thinking about this from the angle that I was asking it from. And I, I, I could see these these kind of visual cues going like, all right, this is what he's looking for. This is what he's prompting me to do here. And they get their, you know, get their mind kind of tuned in to, to what you're looking for. Absolutely. I think as even as an adult in my book, in my book with your book, Jake, that I have when I was when I was making notes, I was adding. Like, I didn't know oh, you had patterns. a book, Mary. I was like, wait, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was adding like those icons. I was like, oh, here's a pattern here. Mm. or here's perspectives here. You know, so I add those icons. Even um, I'm so used to it now. I add it for myself. And I'll, and I'll be honest, like all transparency, um, everyone that's listening um, as a teacher that was teaching teaching program improvement. And I was, um, you know, everyone has to be on the same page at the same time. It really dulled my, my pedagogy and my, my teaching and my Mm -hmm. thinking as an educator and coming out of that for no child left behind coming Mm -hmm. out of that. I really had to, um, shake that fog out, you know, and start really, um, honing my pedagogy uh, back up to where it needs to be. And so this was helpful for me to make sure that I'm not staying in DOK one and two, like I was telling you that I was yeah. pushing past. So stop asking what is, um, you know, list all the character traits of, of, you know, the main character. What if you ask, um, you know, combine, compare and contrast right. the, um, the characters or, or patterns or the ethical, you know, the multiple perspectives, like what if you're comparing, contrasting, if you're synthesizing proof, show me proof, kids yeah. always have to find evidence, you know? So, um, all of those, all of those little, uh, prompts really was beneficial in helping even educators to kind of, to, um, level up their pedagogy. Yeah. I love that. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. And then everyone, our very last, um, part of our framework here is community of learners and learning environment. And this, I feel like is such a, uh, an area where you not only are you creating a safe space for your students. So when your student walks into that classroom, do they see themselves represented there? Do they, um, do they feel safe in that environment? I've been in uh, working environments where I, I didn't necessarily feel like I was in a safe space. So what can, what can be done um, to create that safety? Um, of course, still making room for student voice. I, I know teachers that have blank, they have blank walls until their kids get there. And then their kids add their selves, their voice to that space. Um, they build those classroom norms together. And um, this is where you can also go outside of your classroom and bring your families in. I've had friends that have created flip grids that go home to the parents and then the parents share what is your level of expertise and they share that with the teacher and then the teacher's able to bring in community um, from outside and those parents. I mean, like how awesome would that be, Jake, for for um, your st- your children to show and tell you, my dad does that tag, you know, right. and he helps this, he does that. You could be that resource for, for a family that's like, yeah. we have a Chrome book we don't know we're not quite sure how to do x y and z but you start building that community outside of the walls Mm. because our kids need to really understand that they're they're part of a system you know they're a school system they're part of a family system they could be a church system there's there is your neighborhood system I grew up in apartments with a, with a grandmother. And so I was, I had to navigate all these different systems and spaces and they were all different. When I went home to the apartments, that was a very different system than when I was at school. And so our kids, they are, they need to learn how to be successful in all the systems that they're in and uh, creating those classroom routines, being able to, um, um, know how those systems operate. And school is a system that all kids don't know about. Mm-hmm. Um, I have two uh, boys that live with us right now that are from Hawaii exchange students. Um, I'm teaching them how that system works. This is the school system here in California, maybe different than there. And this is 
this is how you're going to be successful, you know, and allowing them um, that space to add their voice, but also really actively teaching them how to be successful, even if it doesn't make sense sometimes, but teaching them this is this is what's happening. And this is where um, my other passion, social justice, could live, too, because if there is a system that isn't uh, quite working, um, my boys are high school level. Um, dress code was a huge thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was down there for you all, too. But coming back from COVID, dress code was a huge uh, issue. And the students became very um active and had a voice in in um, sharing what they felt uh, needed to be changed. So how can we better um, work in that system? And, and they were heard and there yeah. were some shifts that were made. So I think us as educators being able to scaffold them and support them as they are learning how, how to shift positively and and share their voice, you know, and that advocacy for themselves. I think this is where we we teach them to to be responsible democratic citizens um, mm-hmm. in this in this space, you know, democratic as in our society as a whole, not a pope, you know, not a party. <laughs> but um yeah. how can we, you know, get get along together and, uh, respectfully? We we can have differences, but how can we respect fully um, share those differences with each other, you know, and be able to try to hear each other. This is a great, uh, great place where that can live in community of learners and leaders. And then I'm thinking here, this could be where you could, um, teachers could create those QR codes and have parents come in and kind of scan classroom norms, or even have those flip grids that could be, um, uh, QR coded where parents are, are, uh, sharing their expertise, um, Lots of uh, Google sites would be a great place for um, resources for parents. You know, um, this is this is our classroom. This is how you can. Um, it could be one way com- um, communication or it could be two way. Mm-hmm. if You allow them to to bounce in there. But forms um, I was reading in your book, too. Um, one of the areas where students can um, can create uh, Google forms and j- kind of give that feedback. Yeah. Um, I think this would be a good place for even conferences like, hey, it's time for us to have a talk. Uh, this could go back to those learning partners partnerships. I need to check in. So um, Google Forms could live there too. Yeah. Um, so many things, so many areas. But um, when I look at that, I really think of systems and what can we do to um, thrive in the in those spaces. I like that when you when you you started with kind of things like um, that almost feel like kind of beginning of the year kind of things you do, like mm-hmm. having the students take part in the, the classroom decorations and showing their voices in some way and hearing from the students and maybe uh, connecting with the parents and the families uh, and the community through maybe a flip grid or something. And those things are just showing them that their voice is valued, period, right? And then that levels up then kind of in the order you talked about it, but also in the order it has to happen in to where if there's something that they need to be heard on like something they disagree with like you you talked about the dress code part that Mm -hmm. then by the time you get to there they're more comfortable in doing that and and feel that their voice is valued and it's hard to imagine going from not having even your perspective valued about what you like and what you do um to then advocating for yourself when you feel like you you have something you need to speak up about right like if you if you're always like a, just like a silent party in the classroom it's hard then to get to that point where you, when you need to stand up for yourself you can do you, do you agree absolutely. with that absolutely absolutely and then and and feeling like um I, I just have to be honest Jake like especially with um some of your african american students um there's things that happen in current events that um make you feel like no matter how hard you try like mm you may not be valued, you know? So how do you continue to show that student that they are valued, that they do matter, you know? And um, absolutely providing them safety in that space um, to, to build that advocacy for themselves. That self-advocacy is is important, very important um, for, for students and, and for teachers, you know, there's, there's been um, spaces where our district has had a, um, a staff forum to provide space for teachers and staff members to feel safer in the space. So it, it, it goes both ways, you know, it's for your students as well as uh, for your adult learners too. Mm, I think that what you said in there about the, the students of color and having that, that issue, um, 
and with kind of like like breaking through that barrier that they've all, always seen there and and developing that connection with them and that that comfort i think i think it takes time and that's important for us to remember mm-hmm. as a teacher we can't just take one step um and then expect okay now everything's better and this, this student's going to feel comfortable talking to me or working for me or we're gonna have a good relationship it, it's it's almost like a habit right we absolutely i was talking to my wife this morning we have this this uh, little rack in our in our closet where we put our hangers and we had one there for years and it broke and we had to get a new one and it, i just set it up a couple of days ago and i put all the hangers on it facing the other direction without even realizing it and now every day when i go to put a hanger on it i i start to put it on the wrong way which is the old <laughs> way and i have to flip it over i was saying to her i said i've been doing this now for more than a week and every day i go to put the <laughs> hanger on facing the wrong direction and i was saying and my, my wife's a school psychologist so of course we can geek out about this kind of stuff <laughs> i was saying i wonder how long it's going to take before my brain just starts putting it on this new way because That's for right. right now i still have to keep reminding myself and I think I've never thought of the habit piece being a part of this. These these students that come from different backgrounds of the majority of their teachers have gone through so many years of of feeling this certain way about their teachers and their school experience and their school community. One time of doing something special is not likely to break that cycle. Like that that's me turning the hanger over to the right direction one time, right? I'm gonna have to turn that hanger over. They, I think they say 29 times on average to break a At habit least. and make a new habit. Oh, yep. Right. So so yep. it's gonna take lots of steps before that happens. And and those steps could be little things like just the conversation in the hallway or or that, you know, the, the messages coming in from the parents showing their culture at home or being a part of developing classroom norms or whatever yeah. it might be. But there's going to have to be, for many students, dozens of times of these things happening before they really feel like this is part of their new environment. Absolutely, Jake. And, and adding to that, too, just like say your hanger situation where you go for 50 days and you're doing it right. And then mm-hmm. that one day when you're on autopilot, you do it wrong. And then, you you know, the other way, then you mm-hmm. have to reset yourself and go back. So yeah. like my my That's hoodie hat point. thing, you know, like I feel like I'm very comfortable with kids wearing hats and hoods. I know, you know, it, it's I've I have worked on that. But what if I walk into a space and that that triggers goes yeah. all the way? So it's it's like you're always kind of rechecking the that bias or building those relationships. I have had, um, one of the strategies in, in Zaretta Hammond's book is to, you know, kind of spotlight two or three students a day so mm-hmm. that you're checking in with those two. So maybe those are the two that you're looking at. You're, you're consciously, um, you know, making sure that, that you are building that partnership, checking in, you're doing that with them and then you rotate through so that you, you get through. So you're not always, um, you know, addressing your squeaky wheels, you know, you're, yeah. you're still getting to those kids that may be quiet or, um, you know, everyone gets some time with you. So being intentional, and I had to be very intentional with that as a teacher as well, yeah, um, to make sure that I, I get through everyone. Um, my, my son's a, a quiet child, so he would love to, to blend into the background and not be seen <laughs> yeah. at all. So yeah. I would have to make sure that I am intentional with that. And, and for some of them, I think it's a defense mechanism too, too, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like your son, he might be doing it because that's what he prefers. Oh, but yeah. other kids might be like avoiding doing it because, like, who, who knows what what kind of you know fears? But it's but it's a defense mechanism to to avoid those kinds of conversations. Absolutely, absolutely, and and being like for for all of this, when we're talking about uh, culturally responsive teaching, when we're just talking about connecting with students in general, um, if there's parts that people are uncomfortable with, you know, talk to a trusted uh, friend, talk to someone that that may want to team teach with you on on a subject or an area where you can feel comfortable and and safe in that. Um, I know that we do, like you and I have had conversations. Yeah. I have had conversations with other PLN members. What does this look like through your perspective? Because right. we don't know, you know, and um, and we really strengthen and empower each other. So in, in the workplace, like I hope teachers understand that it, it is not safe to work in a silo by yourself. Right. It is not, you know, it's not healthy. <laughs> it's not healthy for us. Um, so so see if there's sometimes it might be going outside of your school district um, or, or not school district, but school, you know, um, if you aren't able to find some safety there but but team up with someone you yeah. know because it it is so much 
um, I, I find it to be comforting to be able to have these conversations with other adults um, and then, you know, kind of equip us and then move on with our students or adult learners for us, you know, for us, we work with both. So, um, you know, and it's a different shift, but it's still basically the same principles. We all want to be heard and seen and valued. Right. I love that point. That's great that you bring that up. And on the note of, you know, so you mentioned finding those people that you, those trusted people that you can talk to about these things as you kind of grow through your practice as an educator, there's also opportunities to connect with people who are, are thought leaders in these spaces too. And, and so that, that brings me to, I know if people happen to be in the Illinois area, you're going to be part of IdeaCon as a thought leader in the equity strand. So that's a, that's a great way, not just to tap into your expertise, but a whole group of amazing thought leaders uh, in that space in the equity strand there um, in, in Illinois. So if people happen to be in that area. I know uh, you've got uh, past, uh, past educational duct tape podcast guests on there, Dr. Sheldon Aikens too. Um, and a handful of other people there too. But then for those of us who aren't in that area, um, tell us a little bit about uh, Equity in Action CA before we before we wrap up. I know it's the, the hashtag that you're a founding co-member of. I, I'm sure you'll welcome in us non-Californians too. But what, <laughs> so, so tell me more about it. Oh, thank you so much. So actually, you know what, Jake? This this is um, this is a group of educators. So we all have real jobs. You know, we are educators that we're going to these technology conferences and looking around and saying, "Where where's the diversity? Like, mm-hmm. there's no one that looks like me. And mm-hmm. what can we do to shift that? So we actually um, Equity in Action CA is actually a participatory action research group that we created to start going to these conferences. And we, we asked the conference people, um, cr- um, promoters to give us some space to pull data to see who's in the space. Wow. Um, and then how can we build others around that? And we have been together, I want to say maybe two or three years now. And we have been able to host some events where we are having those conversations. Um, so we have had people at our events that were all over, um, all over the United States to come into that space. And actually, Dr. Sheldon Eakins was a guest speaker at one of our spaces on building welcoming spaces for adults as well as children. Mm-hmm. So Equity in Action mm-hmm. is going to be at Q. Nice. Um, as well, Spring Q, um, they're going to uh, to be there. They're everywhere. I have um, b- I went back to school, everyone, so I'm on a little bit of a hiatus, but the the group is still going strong, and um, and that work is there. So we could, um, I can give you a link for their um, the website, yeah. and then people can stay connected because we are actually uh, creating Equatorium Three, which is going to be um, their third. Um, uh, their third event and shout out to uh, QLA for being the first um, organization to actually sponsor one of our events, our very first equity in action event. Um, so it, it's been fantastic because my favorite part, um, everyone is that um, it's not, it's not taped. So you can, you it's not recorded. So you can have real conversations mm. that could be um, uncomfortable, but growing um, yeah. for you in a safe space. And those breakout rooms have been the the most real and vulnerable and just icky and, and feel good. And right. just, you know, like you find your people that, that push you, challenge you, um, affirm you um, to grow and doing what's best for kids, you know, nice. what, what's best for kids and adult learners. I mean, cause again, we, um, we work with each other as well as working um, with the students. So it has been fantastic to see that blossom and grow. And it's all in, um, in the name of equity and, and being able to allow access to all learners. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Send me that, that link and I will for sure put it in the, in the show notes so that people can check that out. Um, and I think that everybody's going to run out and follow you on on the Twitters <laughs> and on the Instagram so to keep learning more from you. We'll we'll all be understanding that while you're going for the PhD, you might be a little bit slower to respond than a tweet and stuff like that. But we know thank we know when those you. little nuggets come out, and I read, we'll know we know they'll be powerful there. Ah, uh, thank you so much. This has been such a treat um, to be able to have this conversation, especially with you, Jake. Again, I feel like people get to have a sneak peek at what our conversations are like when we're together. Right. It's like like this everyone yes we we take a thought we dissect it and we we figure out how we can um you know how we can make it great and how we I, can be impactful 
Yeah, I love that we went right from being silly, right, right into being serious. And, we, and you and I, like, neither of us batted an eye, right? We went from being goofy right into being serious. And we just were just like, okay. We're like, yep. we both have a switch that we just flip on. That's who we are. <laughs> it all started with food, people. It all, all started, started with, with food. food. Barbecue. <laughs> I love it. Nice. Well, thank you so much for being on today, Nairi. This was so much fun. Oh, thank you, Jake. I really appreciate it. It it has been a blast. And um, I look forward to our next shenanigans and adventure. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure if I know a nicer person than Nairi, but I'm also glad that I had her on, not just for how nice she is, but for the info that she showcased. I I have learned a lot from her over the years, and culturally responsive teaching is a journey that I'm trying to really lean into now. In the past, I thought, as I mentioned earlier, kind of naively about this as being just those things where we're explicitly talking and teaching about different cultures and races and backgrounds and religions. And even though I believe in those things and they belong in our schools at certain times, I've also been like, how does this fit into my science classroom on a daily basis? And the reason I thought that is because I didn't really realize until recently the full depth of what culturally responsive responsive teaching is. Um, It's not how do I explicitly involve these things into science um, because my heart was in the right place, but my mind wasn't. As as Nairi showed us, there are observable practices that we could focus on that can be and should be part of everything we do, and they're not always talking about these things. It's not the explicit talks about these things. It's the things that we do that is observable, but is part of just pedagogy, part of the way we teach that is culturally responsive. Let's review a few things that we learned about from Nairi. She taught us about what culturally responsive teaching is, the act of bringing all of the child and even teacher into the classroom to make connections and amplify learning. She talked about the Ready for Rigor framework from Zaretta Hammond and its four categories, which are awareness, learning partnerships, processing, and community. She also taught us about depth and complexity and the icons that can help us keep them in mind when we design our instruction and content. And this is a great example, by the way, of how there's nothing like that. That doesn't specifically relate to what two years ago Jake thought culturally responsive teaching is, right? What I thought it was then, that that doesn't really relate to depth and complexity, but that's because I was wrong. And, I, and I've and i learned uh, through this work and through this time and through listening to people and through listening to my friend Nairi too. Uh, Nairi also taught us about content imperatives and the work of Sandra Kaplan and Betty Gold. And we chatted about the Equity and Action CA website and their Equitarium events. All of those things are linked in the show notes. You can check them out. I hope that you're also going to run out and follow Nairi on Twitter at Ms. M S Nairi N Y R E E Clark or on Instagram at Nairi underscore edu or on her website at nairiclark.com. Up next, let's jump into the celebration of the adjacent possible. Hi, my name is Melissa Dills. I'm a tech integration specialist at Lake Local Schools in Ohio. And I love the book by Jake Miller called Educational Duct Tape. And right now this is hanging on my door. Well, I took it off, but I this was hanging on my door because this is the book that I am just finishing up. And one of the things that I told my colleagues is that it's funny, inspiring, and relevant. And you don't find that a lot in books nowadays, but to talk about tech and still be relevant is amazing, I think, in a book. And Jake Miller does that with tons of wit and comedy, with great stories of himself, his family, his colleagues, his students, all kinds of people who um, have used these tools and lots of great stuff in there. So I think you'll love it. I think your colleagues will love it. And no matter how much or how little you know about tech, there's something in there for you. So check it out. Next up, time for the celebration of the adjacent possible. This is the time where we hear new possibilities from the minds that are adjacent to us, the adjacent possible. Other educators, other duct tapers, you. By hearing from each other and sharing with each other, we add new items to our own adjacent possibilities. 
All right. Our first share for the adjacent possible here is going to be my buddy, Brian Carpenter, host of the podcast Fresh Air at Five and the Twitter videos Fresh Air at Five, which become the podcast episodes. And he reflects on just about every episode of the Educational Duct Tape podcast. And I thought this part of his most recent reflection on the Dr. Will, Will uh, D'Amport episode uh, was really valuable. And there were some takeaways there. So he recorded two videos uh, that day. And this was the second of the video. So take it away, Brian. One more thing for November 19th, 2021, continuing my thoughts about learning management systems based on the episode of Educational Duct Tape podcast with Jake Miller that he had with Dr. Will Damport um, on episode 68. Uh, I use Moodle in our space. That's the learning management system that we have. I like it. Am I married to it? No. But uh, what we do need to realize is what you have, you need to be able to use and use it well. Jake, you talked about functional over fancy. There are places where you just got to get the job done and get it functionally done before you make it fancy. Schoology sounds fancy and uh, that's good. That's really good if they can do that in a functional way. Um, if you're sacrificing function, though, for fancy, then I think that it's not a great thing. The first time I saw Google Classroom, I laughed because I'm like, who is ever going to use that? It was basically functional, like just functional at the time. It wasn't pretty at all, and I laughed. But now today, I am a big proponent of using Google Classroom. That was five years ago that I laughed, maybe six years ago. And uh, now today, this is one of the primary ways that we have in our school's district right now. And as we have flood, uh, you know, remote learning situations going on where schools are closed due to the flood and kids can't get to school and when they're safe and able they can join Google Classroom that's a way that teachers can engage their students from afar in a very functional simplistic manner that doesn't require a lot of uh, pre preloading and uh, student understanding to be able to get there. Parents can get there and figure it out, which is pretty cool. All right, so uh, the point is, whatever you're using, become familiar and comfortable with it so that you can utilize the tools that are there. If those tools aren't there, figure out how you can bring tools in to allow students to draw and uh, create and make videos and record audio. Um, one Another one that we're using in our district with our little ones is Seesaw. So I'm excited about that opportunity to see technology being used by your littles. All right, Jake, thanks. And uh, Dr. Will, thank you so much. Have a great day, guys. Peace out. Bye. All right, if you couldn't tell, uh, Brian is out for his walk as he's recording that. And that's what Brian does in his morning walks. I think it's a really cool way to reflect on the learning that he's doing. And it's impressive just how many things, like if you look, like I see my educational duct tape uh, reflections from Brian once every two or three weeks or whatever when I re- release an episode. But in between, there's there's these uh, reflections almost every day. It's insane uh, how much Brian is taking in uh, by listening to this podcast, how much he's learning, how dedicated he is to this, and how much he's reflecting on it. I think it's really cool. And I think I, I really like his points here because I, I think all of those learning management systems he talked about in there are fantastic. I'm a big fan of Schoology. I use Google Classroom. I do training sometimes on Seesaw and love Seesaw. And he talked about Moodle in there. And I used Moodle a lot during my master's classes. You don't see it a lot in K-12 schools, but I think Moodle is a phenomenal program too. And the cool thing about all of them is they all have their functional pieces that you could start with when you're learning how to use them. And they also have their fancy pieces that you can level up to uh, during the time you're using them. For example, example, Google Classroom is the most widely used of these. You could certainly start off just using Google Classroom to uh, communicate due dates and assignments and things like that. And then you start assigning things that are in docs in there. And then you start assigning things that are in slides in there. And then you start assigning Jamboards. And then you start assigning you know, organizing your uh, classwork page. And then you start doing hyperdocs in there. There's lots of different ways that you can level it up and make it fancier and fancier and fancier and simultaneously more functional. But sometimes we'd have to pick the function first and work on the fancy later and give ourselves permission for that time. It's the same with Schoology and Seesaw and Moodle. They're all phenomenal tools. We start with the functional pieces if that's all we could do at first. And then we add in the fanciness, which does bring in a lot of additional function as we go. So thank you for those reflections, Brian. I really enjoyed hearing Uh, your story about your first impressions with Google Classroom. It's kind of funny to think back on how we responded to new tech tools when they first came out. I know that I was... I was excited about Google Classroom, but I didn't rush out to use it because I was always already using an add-on called Doctopus, which uh, sent out the assignments to my students and gave me links to them. So Google Classroom uh, didn't add in any function that Doctopus didn't have, uh, but then it did later. And so I made the switch uh, as time went on. 
Okay, one more celebration of the adjacent possible. You can always ask me a question on Twitter that I could pop in the podcast feed. And Corey Mathias, a uh, past guest of the show from back, and I think it was the first season, who is at EdTechAntics uh, on Twitter, um, shared this tweet. And I'm going to go ahead and let the immersive reader Chrome extension read it for us. Hey, EDU Twitter. I have a teacher who wants to let students retake a quiz in Google Forms and have the sheet give her the better of the two scores. Anybody have a resource for combining the forms into one sheet and the formulas needed? Well, my first thought, Corey, first of all, quick, great question. My first thought was spreadsheets, yay! <laughs> but then my second thought was, oh, the max formula, because there's a max formula in uh, Google Sheets where you type in equals max, and then in parentheses, you put either the numbers you're dealing with or the cells that you want it to reference, and it'll find you the biggest number in there. And that would work, but the problem is that will just give you the biggest number in the whole set. So you'd have to get really creative with formulas to have it tell you the highest score from each student. There's a way you could do that with formulas. You need some if formulas and some things like that, but it would be a pretty crazy process. So Alice Keeler, who uh, Corey also tagged on the tweet, uh, said immediately five words, use pivot table with max. And I was like, oh yeah, pivot table can do maxes. And when Corey pointed out that not every student took this test twice, and so not only do you need to find the max of their scores, but sometimes a student only took it once. So it was really you know interesting. So I was like, yeah, I, I definitely think a pivot table would be the best way to do this. And Pivot tables seem overwhelming, but really, when you try them, they're not that bad. So I've got a spreadsheet up open here on my computer, and I just really quickly, I put two columns. One is for name, and I titled it name. The other is for score, and I titled it score. And you do want your titles to be, uh, your uh, columns to be titled, which kind of automatically happens in a Google Form assessment. And in the first column, I've got my name twice and Nairi three times and Corey twice and Brian once. And by each of our names, we I wrote scores. And for each person, I wrote lower scores and then at least one score, uh, one score in the 90s. So if this works right, I should end up seeing Jake once with my score of a 99, Nairi once with her score of a 98, Corey once with his score of a 97, and Brian once with his score of a 95, even though we all had other scores uh, that were lower than that. So I've got it in my spreadsheet. I highlight that whole area. So from the title name all the way down to the very bottom score, I go to insert and then pivot table. It is the sixth option down. It asks me if I want it to be in a new sheet of my spreadsheet or an existing one. Well, I don't have an existing sheet ready for it. So I'm going to go with new sheet. I'm going to click create. And then it creates the pivot table, and over on the right is an area called the pivot table editor. And so you have four choices there. What what are your rows going to be? What are your columns going to be? What are your values going to be? And what are your filters going to be? So under rows, I'm going to click add, and I want one row for each student. So I'm going to click name. Okay. And now my table says Brian, Corey, Jake, Nairi. And by default, it alphabetized us too. So if you do this right, uh, Corey, and have last names in there, maybe last name, comma, first name or something like that, it will put them in alphabetical order, which is really handy for then transcribing into your grade book. And it gives me an option. How do you want to order these? So it's ascending by name is what I have here. Okay. Next for columns, what do you want? And actually I'm going to do nothing for columns. You don't have to put in a column. I'm going to drop down to values. I'm going to click add and I have my two options, name or score. So I'm going to click score and it says, how do you want to show the score? And by default, it shows you this, uh, the, the sum of our scores. So Nairi, who took the test three times, has a 243. Well, that doesn't make any sense, Nairi. Come on. So I'm going to change where it says sum to the word max. And bam, it now says Brian, 95, Corey, 97, Jake, 99, Nairi, 98. So it literally just went through there, found our names, found the max score that matched it, and put that in as the number in this pivot table. And it's alphabetized and ready to be typed into our grades, which is pretty phenomenal. And this could be set up in advance too. It doesn't have to be something you do afterwards. It'd be something you do during uh, the assessment and it'll pull those scores in as long as you select a big enough range of your spreadsheet to cover all those areas. I love some spreadsheet talk. Um, if you have another way that you might recommend Corey does this, you can check it out over in the tweet that is in the show notes and you could respond with other ideas for how he might go about this process. If you would like to be a part of the celebration of the adjacent possible in an upcoming episode, we'd love to have you. 
You could share feedback, ask a question, share a takeaway, or share something that you're excited about, whatever you prefer. You could do that with an Apple podcast review, a post on social media with hashtag edu duct tape, on this show's Flipgrid at flipgrid.com slash edu duct tape, or on the show's SpeakPipe page at speakpipe.com slash edu duct tape. Those links, of course, are also in the show notes. And if you share something on one of those platforms, you've got a really good chance that I'll share it here in an upcoming episode. All right, now time for the most important part of the episode, your homework for this episode. And you've got about a month to complete it before I see you again on January 5th or so with a regular full episode. Your homework assignment, I'm I'm, I'm excited about this one, is to find an educator who hates the use of toilet paper tubes in school crafts. (laughs) and tell them about this podcast. Guys, I am super grossed out by the idea of students using old paper, uh, toilet paper tubes to make crafts out of Santas and reindeers and all kinds of ridiculous stuff. Listen, that tube was sitting in the bathroom next to somebody doing their business. We don't need those empty cardboard tubes in our classrooms. Get those out of here. That's how I feel. If you know another educator that feels the same way, go tell them about the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Tell them how me and them are simpatico because we both hate toilet paper tube crafts and tell them to tune into the show. Well, I think I hear my mom calling me in for dinner, so I'd better go inside. (laughs) Before I leave, a reminder, if you'd like some stickers or to pass some out, there's a link in the show notes. And we'd love to have you in the Duct Tapers Facebook group. And if you haven't done it yet, I'd love to have an Apple Podcasts review from you. Thanks for all that you do as a listener, as a lifelong learner, and as an educator. Have a great day, and I will see you in 2022. Well, Actually, I'll see you before that for a bonus episode, but I will see you in a regular episode in 22. Uh, I hope that your holidays are merry and that you enjoy the break that's coming your way. See you soon, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Please consider rating and reviewing the show on your favorite podcast app. Take edu duct tape. Hey, thanks for hanging around to the very end of the show here. I wanted to share a quick note with you about a set of infographics that I have available to you. So after I created the hashtag edu duct tape questions sections of my book, Educational Duct Tape and EdTech Integration Mindset, I wanted to share those extensively researched lists of EdTech tools in a way that would be convenient to those of you in the classroom and to those of you supporting classroom teachers' as tech integration. So uh, I utilized a template and graphics that Monica Isabel Martinez, by the way, Monica and Isabel Martinez is amazing, but she created these graphics and these templates for me to organize this valuable information into individual infographics. Head over to jakemiller.net and search for infographic to see them for yourself.